Thank you all for joining us this evening to learn a little bit more about Pacific Power's wildfire mitigation and safety plan. My name is Drew Hansen. I serve on the Pacific Power communications team and I'll be helping out a little bit with today's webinar. So first, a little bit about the company. Uh, Pacific Power is part of Pacific Corp, which is one of the lowest cost electricity providers in the United States. Pacific Power provides safe and reliable uh, electric service to more than 773,000 customers uh, throughout Oregon, Washington, and California. And every day we work uh, to meet customers' growing electricity needs uh, while protecting and enhancing the environment. You'll hear about a number of the um, innovative ways uh, that we're doing just that uh, during today's presentation. But first, a couple of house cleaning uh, items. The presentation portion of tonight's event should last about 25 minutes, then we'll open it up for questions and answers. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a button uh, called Q&A. You can click that at any time and send your questions straight to us. We're looking forward to answering those questions. Uh, then we'll close the webinar around six o'clock. With that, I'd like to introduce tonight's presenters. Alan Meyer, who, or, I'm sorry, Alan Barrett, who is our uh, Director of Delivery Assurance and Heidi Caswell, our Director of Asset Performance and Wildfire Mitigation. There we go. All right, we advanced <laughs> this slide. All right, here's our, our photos. Thank you, Drew. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, this is Alan. Heidi and I are appreciative of your interest uh, today and uh, as we prepare for a wildfire season together. We want today's meeting to be informative and, and helpful uh, to you and your communities. And so as such, what you see on the screen is the agenda of the topics that we'll be covering. And Heidi is going to be focusing on our plans for wildfire safety and how the areas of elevated risk have been identified. And she'll also be covering the added work and investments that we've made to our system in advance of this uh, year's fire season and the activity that's gonna take place uh, over the balance of the year. And then I'll be covering our community education and outreach and what we're doing, uh, including things such as this webinar, uh, to keep you and your neighbors informed. And then we'll touch on public safety power shutoff, uh, known as PSPS. And finally, we'll look at the steps that we'll be continue, continuing to make uh, over the coming years uh, as part of the wildfire mitigation program. However, before we get started into that, let me just emphasize that our priority is keeping your community safe. Uh, nothing is more important than providing you and your com community with safe, reliable power. That is truly our number one priority. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Heidi and we'll get into some of the detail. Thanks, Alan. Um, I wanna start by describing the process we went through. So our plan is rooted in, rooted in data that was born out of fire threat modeling where we tried to pinpoint areas that are at elevated risk. We used the approach um, that was developed by the CPUC in concert with CAL FIRE and extended that modeling process throughout Pacific Power. Um, util utilizing these concepts, areas were identified where there's an elevated risk of utility associated wildfires to occur and spread rapidly where they could affect communities. Um, and, and we've called these fire high consequence areas. Um, in California, they're defined as high fire threat districts. Um, these are used to prioritize our wildfire mitigation initiatives, um, such as increased inspection, system hardening, and modified operating practices. And I'd like to discuss each of these strategies next. Next slide. So first, being situationally aware of both short-term and long-term risks is a core component of our plan. Um, the long-term is demonstrated through the development of the fire high consequence or high fire threat district areas that we just discussed. The short-term awareness is really supported by monitoring fire weather conditions, altering our operational practices during fire risk periods, and continuing an increasing collaboration with our public safety partners and customers we're actively communicating and definitely in a listening mode. Um, the graphic on the slide shows what our new weather stations look like, which you might see throughout our areas. They help um, support our awareness of fire weather. The next slide um, shows this, uh, the next strategy, which is we're ensuring our facilities are resilient to limit them being a potential source of ignition. 
Some of the key tactics that we've got here are enhanced inspection programs, enhanced and expanded vegetation management practices, and deployment of covered conductors. This added resiliency is key to um, mitigating fire risk. On the photos above, you see a couple of the, um, those snapshots that really show the, the strategy. Um, on the lower left, there are two graphics that show you covered conductor. Um, the far left gives you a kind of a panoramic view of a, of a segment, while the um, second uh, toward the right shows you um, the close-up um, bundled um, uh, configuration. And it's resilient to blow in or other incidental contact that might occur um, when you know winds are heavy and, and things are happening out there. Um, toward the right is a visual of a helicopter, such as how we would use to inspect transmission corridors. While on the far right, you can see radial pole clearing, which is um, accomplished for targeted poles. Next slide. Um, the third strategy that we've got is really to react rapidly to fault events um, and limit then the arc energy um, or the time the, that a portion of the system is exposed to fault current. And when a fault occurs, like what would happen if a branch comes across phase conductors or the, the um, wires that we have, you know, through, throughout the service territory, it's designed to, the system is designed to recognize that sudden fault current and a fuse or reclosing device would operate. And a standard fuse, when, that when it experiences that fault current, could emit hot metal particles that could come into contact with fuel near that location. On the lower right, a non-expulsion fuse is shown. And what that means is that if um, it operates because of fault current, any potential um, uh, emissions are actually contained within that fuel body or within the, um, the fuse body, excuse me. Um, and above that to the, um, to the left, upper left, the, um, that device is actually a non-expulsion lightning arrestor, another component that we have um, on our system that is um, a fire mitigation strategy. The photo in the center actually shows the waveform that um, our sophisticated new um, relays and um, reclosing devices see on the system and they detect any kind of waveform anom anomalies um, and uh, react more rapidly than legacy um, devices would. So now that we've talked about those general strategies or those overarching strategies, let's talk about what we've done to prepare for fire season. On the next slide, you see our pre-fire season activity. So um, a summary of the work um, and the invest of investments that we've made um, to prepare in advance of this year's wildfire season. First, we've completed visual inspections, which we've augmented and embedded into our ongoing program. And this is specifically targeted in those areas that are fire high consequence areas. We've also added vegetation inspections, including, um, again, targeted um, pole clearing or, or pole clearing around targeted poles within the fire high consequence area. To support situational awareness, we've maintained our weather stations that we installed last year. There were 23 of them, and we've initiated daily weather um, and fire weather forecasting as of May 15th. Um, we've also restarted the notification processes um, from the fire professionals, including their communication of red flag warnings and um, our internal alerts um, that, that are shared with operating staff so that they know that there might be um, fire in proximity um, to, to our equipment. Um, additionally, we've developed methods to alert uh, about lightning when it's in proximity to facilities. And finally, to support our operational practices, we're in the last stages of wildfire refresher training for our employees and activating our no test policy on red flag warning days. During 2020, our plans include um, evaluating the enhanced triggers that support PSPS decisions. And Alan touched on this a bit briefly, and we'll talk about it more um, in the future, but that's the public safety power shutoff and how we would um, in, incorporate the data in order to make that decision. We've also, um, we're in the midst of detailed design and estimating of system hardening projects. We're also delivering a portion of those, and that includes this year 90 miles of covered conductor, 
76 relays and reclosers and conducting about 20 pilot project locations evaluating um, new technology called incipient fault detection or distribution fault anticipation. We're also adding 22 new weather stations um, and throughout the service territory we have um, adopted alternate relay um, and recloser settings that allow us to configure the um, devices for different um, uh, fire weather periods. We continue to collaborate with, um, uh, with our public safety partners, including um, the state forestry agencies and also the um, county emergency management um, folks. And we're enhancing our data sets for vegetation management um, using a variety of technologies to, um, to tune that better yet. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to Alan Barrett to continue this discussion. Thanks, Heidi. Um, another important component of our planning and preparation is ensuring that you and your neighbors have the information you need to prepare. And as you can see on the screen, we are reaching out to our customers in multiple ways. And through the month of May and June, we're running a series of wildfire safety related advertisements in our service areas that have the elevated risk of wildfire that the FACA areas that Heidi was just describing. Um, and those advertisements are reinforcing a wildfire safety message while also directing individuals to our website for additional information and resources that are available to them. One of the items that we want to highlight in our communication is the public safety power shutoff or the PSPS. And we want to emphasize that this is a last resort measure in our wildfire mitigation plan. But in the event of extreme wildfire weather conditions, we might initiate a PSPS. And this is a, a proactive measure to shut off power during weather conditions that could result in a catastrophic wildfire. Now, what leads up to that? There's no single factor that drives a PSPS, um, and each one is a unique situation. It takes into account the weather, how dry it is, hot, windy days. It takes into account local information by reaching out to emergency services, local officials, our own field employees to get a sense of what's really going on in the community, what would be the impact of a PSPS event, what is the duration of the forecasted weather. All these things come together in the decision making of whether or not a, a PSPS event will occur. The expected frequency uh, based on historical weather data is that a PSPS event is, would not be a, a common event to occur. And although it's impossible to predict uh, with complete certainty uh, when and where and how often extreme weather conditions could occur, just given the rapid uh, changing environmental conditions that do exist and, and we're recognizing that. A PSPS event will last as long as the extreme wildfire weather conditions uh, exist and, and as long as it takes for us to inspect and repair our equipment in the affected area to make sure it's safe and that we can restore the power without incident. I also want to note that the steps of a PSPS event as far as de-energizing sections of our system is is a very similar to part of our normal planned outage process where we might take a planned outage as part of a, a typical construction system uh, in, enhancement on a section of our line. And we would use those same tools and controls uh, to initiate a PSPS event, to de-energize a section of line, use those same tools to communicate with our customers on what to expect leading up to that de-energization during and even the eventual restoration of power, we'd be in communication with customers, letting them know where we're at and what to expect. So we'd use the same tools that we have in our normal planned outage process in the PSPS event as well. Specific to PSPS outreach and communication, earlier this month, an email was sent out to city and county officials uh, that are in our potential PSPS areas, updating them about the work that we're planning uh, as far as mitigation wildfire efforts and also a new web tool and, and web resources that are available. Uh, similar communications went out and bill messages that will be running until the end of June, which will notify customers who are in these potential PSPS areas and where they can find additional information on our website. 
And on your screen right now is the new tool that we've put on the website that's available uh, for customers, which is an interactive map. You can see that on the left-hand side of the screen there, where customers can go online, enter in their address, and that interactive map will zoom in to that location and describe whether or not that location is within a PSPS area. If it is in the PSPS area, it will describe the name of that specific PSPS area and the current status. Below the table on that same web page is, or below the map is a table of all the PSPS areas and provides a seven day forecast of that PSPS um, area based on the weather conditions and weather forecasting from the weather stations that we've installed. So the status is for the next seven days of, is it normal? Is there a watch event coming up based on weather that we'll be keeping an eye on that area? or is it actually in an event, and how long is that event forecasted to take place? My final point on community outreach is to note that we, are plan we were planning on holding wildfire safety community events, but uh, ultimately canceled due to the current public health crisis. And so if this webinar is an example and a replacement of what those in-person meetings were going to be, but it's communicating the same updates and same content that we would have done in those in-person meetings as well all part of our communication uh, outreach that we're taking place for the wildfire mitigation plan. All right, now we're gonna transition to how the proposed mitigation plans that Heidi was describing in the programs, how those all come together to reduce the PSPS impact uh, on our customers. And so what you see on the screen is a summary for a given PSPS area where we take all the programs, um, whether it's situational awareness, the fault detection, the system hardening, into one view for an area so that individuals in that area can get a sense of how the, all the programs work together to mitigate the impact of a PSPS. Now, a mitigation of a PSPS can mean several things. It could mean the reduction of the footprint, the, the size of that PSPS area, it could mean the triggering thresholds of what it means to enter into a PSPS event could be increased, or it could mean the possible elimination of that PSPS area altogether from the plan, which we agree is the ultimate goal of the mitigation is to eliminate it from the PSPS plan altogether. With more experience and analysis as we continue with our wildfire mitigation, we'll be able to confidently describe the phasing, the timing, the sequencing of this activity, and the end mitigation status of each area. And we'll be able to communicate that on our website as well. For our last slide, uh, before beginning the questioning and answer portion, I just want to point out uh, the magnitude of the wildfire mitigation efforts that will be ongoing until 2026. Shown on the screen is some of the the, the programs and the amount of work that will be ongoing. So you see the 2,000 miles of covered conductor, 3,000 pole replacements, 133 relays installed, 68 distribution reclosers, and by the time we're done, 64 weather station in, installations as well. This all requires engineering, estimating, construction resources that all has to be coordinated with all the other work that is also occurring in these areas. That is a lot of work to accomplish. And we just want to communicate that we are working on wildfire safety year round and with continuous rigor until this work is completed. So with that, uh, Drew, I think we're ready to open it up if there's any questions that might've come in while we were uh, reviewing the program. Yeah, thank you, Heidi and Alan, for all that great information. I think it's, uh, it's really good. and. So we do have uh, some that are coming in. Again, just a reminder, if you wanted to uh, look towards the bottom of your screen, there's a little button that says Q and A. Uh, go ahead, click on that. You can type in your question and then it'll be sent to us and then we can um, answer them as they come in. So it looks like one of the questions that has come in is how many cellular towers and or public safety radio infrastructure assets are in the potential PSPS shutoff areas? And what have we done to note those and help mitigate against the impacts uh, for those locations in, in those areas? And, and part of the 
PSPS preparation for each of those areas that are in a potential PSPS area, we reach out to all the impacted utilities in that area, emergency services, to gain an understanding of what is the impact if, uh, if we had to go into a uh, turn the power off during a PSPS event. And part of that process is to note the location and whether or not there's an impact um, by turning that tower off or whether they have their own backup generation and are capable of um, riding through an event on their own. We're also reaching out to part of that process is to reach out to telecom and get that answer from them so that they too can be a part of the process, provide us the, those locations and their concerns. Yeah, maybe if I could add a little bit to that, Alan. Um, what we did was evaluated what was identified by the CPUC as critical customers, and that really was the underpinning of what was um, what was shared with emergency services and telecommunications companies, so that they could um, uh, so that we were all uh, in in kind of uh, on the same page in terms of the criticality. So. Um, so we use those critical accounts that are critical customer types that were defined um, that did include telecommunications and emergency services to make sure again that um, that uh, we had we had agreement and an understanding and um, want to make sure that they're in uh, any any of those facilities are in lockstep in terms of planning for the um, a PSPS event. Okay. All right. Another question that came in here, um, I think Heidi, this uh, kind of pertains to your uh, your expertise here. Are you accessing other public weather sites like Weather Underground, My Weather Station reports uh, every five seconds to the Weather Underground? Seems like it would be a good to have that info. So basically, are we? Uh, what other um, kind of third-party uh, weather um, service providers are we getting information from? Yeah. So um, so we've in installed these uh, weather stations. They communicate every 10 minutes to um, data that's aggregated at the University of Utah, which houses um, them, those those uh, data records and a variety, thousands of other um, data records in Meso West, which you can actually go online and see Meso West um, out of the University of Utah and see that. So that's the kind of the, um, the, the, the visible to everyone. We also, the, the weather um, service also includes some of the, um, uh, the models that are run on a, um, on a ongoing basis that support some of the microclimatology, the understanding of the, the microclimatology. Um, but yeah, there's a, you're, you're right. There's a lot of weather data available and we need to make sure and incorporate all of that into understanding um, what uh, what's going on very locally. Thank you, Heidi. All right, another question just came in. Uh, how are vulnerable uh, slash medical needs slash life support individuals enumerated in county plans identified and categorized? And how does this identification differ from how public entities ID these individuals? Does this include individuals dependent on hearing aids? So reaching out to our customers and part of that communication plan, letting them know that if they know they fall into this can of category of vulnerable and medical needs, life support individuals, letting them know to contact us and let us know that they are that category so that in our system we can note that and know that part of our PSPS process is to reach out to those individuals um, and give them notification in advance of a PSPS. Uh, event occurring, right? Yeah, and uh, another <clears throat> strategy around that to um, uh, communicate with that population is working with community-based organizations, um, social service um, organizations, and medical clinics, and making sure that they have uh, our information um, because they know those populations well and able to uh, get that information to those individuals. And then another uh, question coming in, are there Spanish speaking staff at Pacific Powers Customer Care Center? Are there plans to make emergency communications and website content available in Spanish? Um, and the answer to all that is yes. Um, we do have in our customer care center, a Spanish speaking staff that can uh, take those phone calls. And just recently uh, we uh, established a Spanish um, uh, webpage specific to wildfire safety and public safety power shutoff uh, that is 
uh, currently on our website. And it's also, I guess, valuable to know that other languages are also supported, right? That, that is correct. There are a number of other uh, languages that are supported uh, through our call center. Um, individuals uh, with specific language needs, as they call in, we uh, contract with a service um, that will be able to facilitate that conversation uh, based on the topic. So I know one of the, obviously, the first question that came in was about how we're noting communication critical infrastructure but if you often there's other questions about how we're partnering with local communities for other infrastructure emergency services and, uh, and I guess we just to note that that's exactly we want to partner with each community local services to make sure that we're coordinated um, and that we understand what infrastructure is in place what are their concerns going into an event and that we would pull that together as part of even the decision making of a PSPS event is to reach out to local you know, agencies and, and, and understand what infrastructure is impacted to make that decision together. And, uh, another question here, the work you're doing, uh, will it avoid a public safety power shutoff in the future um, and how long to complete that work? Right, so I touched on it there at the end to give you a feel for the amount of work that is in the scope of the wildfire mitigation taking place all the way out to 2026 with the goal of minimizing the, the PSPS events and impacts, right? The goal and so how many there will be as the wildfire mitigation plan unfolds. I also noted it's already anticipated to be a rare event based on historical weather data we have available to us and coupled that with the mitigation work that we have planned would make it even less likely as a required mitigation step. Okay, thank you for that. Um, in the event of an anticipated public safety power shutoff, will you provide representatives to the state and local emergency uh, command centers uh, in the affected areas? That is part of our process. Our emergency management um, department um, would be in coordination with that, and we would provide a, a representative to be tied into that process. Mm -hmm. um, Heidi, this one uh, might be for you here. Uh, you mentioned installing covered conductors. Assuming you are talking about primary voltages, do you have concern about relay coordination in a down primary event? So um, we we have experience with not just covered conductor, but what we what's called spacer cable, where um, the covered conductor uh, uh, the graphic showed it in a um, a configuration. Um, it's a it's it's intended to um, this the the it's it's a designed it's designed to have the connection between the pole and the um and the arm the the bracket basically be kind of the the weak link in it um and the and we've had experience with this installation no problems with it uh, performing uh and failing i guess um we still have process that um recognizes there could be a concern around uh, down conductor. So when we have installed covered conductor in an area and we know that there has been um, wind uh, or other kind of physical damage that could have occurred or wind or other things that could have caused physical damage, we um, patrol those particular areas to make sure that there is um, no risk. And this is an area where um, we're anticipating that the new relays that we install will also help us understand whether there have been any changes. So kind of the convergence of the sophisticated um, relays along with that um, incipient fault detection um, are expected to provide us the assurance that everything is exactly as it should be. Okay, thanks for that, Heidi. If there is a wildfire already burning, um, our local emergency personnel would be swamped. Will we be looking at power outages on top of that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And it, and it goes back to that coordination of leading up to if a PSPS event uh, is looking like it's required. Is That's exactly why we would reach out and coordinate with local personnel. Uh, personnel. We don't want a PSPS event to make the situation worse 
And so it's an understanding of what does uh, local emergency management need of us. And our, we, we can sectionalize our system based on that feedback to try to accomplish both. Keep the power on where they need the power on for whatever the current situation is and minimize uh, the, you know, where the, the power is during a PSPS event. So it comes down to that situational awareness and um, just really being plugged in with the, the local uh, people on the ground to know what's happening and yeah okay thank you Alan uh, when and where will this recording be posted will it be sent to all registered attendees um, we will have this in the next 24 to 48 hours it will be posted onto the um, Pacific Power website at pacificpower.net forward slash wildfire safety and then uh, yes uh, I, I, I will uh, get that out to registered attendees as well so that you have a copy I'll have to look into how to do that, but we will get it to you. Um, looks like we have uh, one more question here. So if you, if you have anything else uh, that you'd like to ask, uh, please feel free to send it in, but this is the last one that we have on the, the list so far. Uh, how do you coordinate with neighboring electric utilities? Presumably, presumably uh, the public safety power shutoff areas are just within Pacific Power Service territories. So, I'm trying to think of a, of a scenario. The PSPS areas are at the distribution level, and as far as interconnection, there wouldn't be with another utility. Um, so it is the Pacific Power Service territory where we've defined the areas that we can de-energize and not impact a neighboring utility. That's not to say we couldn't be in coordination with a neighboring utility to give them our status and what we're thinking and see what they might be doing during the same event, um, but it's not that we're interconnected. I think it's worth noting, Alan, as well, that the PSPS areas are kind of micro in nature. I mean, we've tried to keep them small um, so that so that there isn't, you know, kind of a, 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 um, a wholesale um, uh, de-energization for an area. Good point. Thanks for that added context, Heidi. Can you say more about sectionalizing critical infrastructure and how consulting local organizations plays into that decision? Right, so it goes back to the mitigation plans where we were summarizing the programs together in, in an area. And when we look at a PSPS area, we also know the critical infrastructure in that community working with local officials. And we review those plans with them to explain what sectionalizing we have available to us on the system and what our mitigation plans will also include. Um, and so with their feedback of an understanding of, well, what, where do they see the critical infrastructure? Where is it? What are their needs? And where is our, can our system be sectionalized uh, to accomplish both um, is where we bring their, their feedback into the process. And so we didn't uh, do this in a vacuum. It is definitely with the coordination of uh, the local communities and, and ongoing, I should note that as well. It wasn't that we just did it one time at the beginning of this process, but it becomes an annual exercise of reviewing that in case something changed or even as we implement these mitigation plans with the covered conductor and all that the areas that are impacted on a, of a PSPS will be changing and the boundaries moving uh, as the mitigation plan is implemented. All right another question will you be coordinating a similar Q&A in each affected community? Um, you know Plans right now, we're still in very close communication with uh, community leaders, um, emergency management, um, and local officials. And we have uh, tabletop exercises, uh, basically, which would kind of do a, a role play if a PSPS were to happen. Um, and right now, you know, we're, we are continuing to work closely with those groups and organizations. Um, and if they uh, express a, a desire to have a Q&A, we'll definitely uh, make that available. But right now, um, in addition to having this webinar on the website, uh, all um, customers uh, within PSPS areas um, will receive an email with a link to this webinar as well, uh, letting them know that this is available for them to view. Let's see here, looks like we have a Okay, a couple more coming in here. So just a note, um, thank you for taking a large area of Hood River out of the public safety, pow public safety power shutoff area. 
are you going to continue to reduce the size of the PSPS areas around Hood River and or elsewhere? Right. The, that would be the first example where we've seen the impacts of our PSPS uh, mitigation plans where we were able to look at that area, that core Hood River area, implement uh, some additional switches, uh, sectionalization of the system, reclosers, relays, and uh, felt confident that we could remove that area from the PSPS plan. And yes, that is the ultimate goal. We're, through these mitigation plans, we'll be looking to reduce that footprint, remove those areas from the PSPS plan. That is the goal. Have you put any new switches in a tier three uh, area of Siskiyou, uh, Siskiyou County to minimize? We've, um, we have installed specific uh, equipment and are actually starting our first covered conductor installation that is focused around the, uh, the circle um, uh, that, um, uh, that, uh, um, that it, we call the ring fence around um, uh, Mount Shasta. So that is a big, the bigger part of our tier three in, um, in uh, California. So you'll see you'll see uh, crews beginning that work here shortly. Um, we have installed a certain amount of equipment. Okay, in the long term, uh, how is Pacific Power investing in communities to survive power shutoffs? Uh, I think this might go into some of the um, stuff you covered towards the end there, Alan, about um, the mitigation, um, construction, and system hardening. And, and there's an all, also an aspect to that of if we go into a, a PSPS event, what are we doing uh, to offer, you know, a resource to the communities that might not have power during that event, right? And providing uh, resources by partnering with local community organizations that might or, already be in effect in that area, uh, where we can provide stations to help with communication, charging, and just uh, keep keeping everyone apprised of the status of, of what is going on during these events. So that's also part of a PSPS, uh, a plan if we enter into one of those events, is how to provide those resources during the event. Another one here. Um, are you open to coming to various meetings to present to us uh, locally and or virtually? Absolutely, and that's where we are hoping to, this is one of the communication vehicles we're using, obviously, to reach out to a broad audience, but it, as there might be an, a need to continue these types of events, we prefer the face-to-face, -face, but if they're going to be, you know, virtual, mm -hmm. we can provide that, absolutely, uh, to help with the communication and just the education on what is a part of the wildfire mitigation efforts that are ongoing. Um, I kind of have a question that I, I, I've heard a few times. Um, I guess the first part would be, has Pacific Power conducted a public safety power shutoff? Uh, it goes back to what goes into triggering a PSPS event, mm -hmm. right? And based on the weather and the thresholds and that local information of what's going on and the forecast of duration of that weather event. And as we've stated that based on the historical weather information available to us, it is a rare event. And so you, you, we wouldn't have be expecting uh, one to have occurred so far. Um, but that's not to say we are not monitoring the weather and uh, constantly during fire season and keeping an eye on it and even noticing if we're approaching a watch scenario where we would communicate out that we're, you know, that we would want to put customers on notice of even the potential. So that is all part of it. Um, but to describe why we have not is because we have not had the need. Mm -hmm. so. Thanks for that, Alan. Okay. Who is the best person to contact for further information? Um, you can contact uh, me, Drew Hansen. Um, I'll give out my, my email here. I put, should put this in the slide, but D R E W dot h-a-n-s-o-n at pacificcorp.com and that's p-a-c-i-f-i-c-o-r-p dot c-o-m uh, just feel free to send me an email and uh, we'll, we'll get you the information that you're looking for all right okay well, I think that uh, we can kind of about wrap things up here 
again, if, if uh, another question comes to mind, uh, whether it's today or tomorrow, whenever, feel free to send me an email. Again, that's drew.hanson, D-R-E-W dot H-A-N-S-O-N at pacificcorp.com, P-A-C-I-F-I-C-O-R-P dot C-O-M. Um, Thank you all for coming out and joining us for our wildfire safety and mitigation presentation. And thank you, Alan and Heidi, uh, for sharing all this great information. Uh, as noted before, we'll have this webinar available on our web website. Um, so if you'd like to share it with others, you can uh, send the link. And also you can find uh, the maps that were mentioned earlier, earlier, the interactive map and the forecasting table and a wildfire safety and preparedness resource center. Uh, all that can be found at pacificpower.net forward slash wildfire safety. Again, thank you all for spending some time with us on this important topic. Uh, we look forward to continuing, um, you know, the significant work and providing you all with information and updates. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day and stay well. Thank you.